I would like to welcome you all to this very first symposium of the Water Development Partnership Program. We are very excited to have so many of you here with us. In the coming three days, it is our aim to encourage critical and reflective discussions to shed light on the complex processes involved in addressing water challenges in an inclusive and sustainable way in various parts of the world. We therefore look forward to your inputs during this symposium so that together we can discuss what is needed to make impacts beyond reporting. Over the last weeks, as we prepared for this event, our team has been battling with feelings of hopelessness and heartbreak, which I'm sure many of you share. By seeing the extreme violence and injustices being perpetrated against innocent civilians in an increasing number of places in the world, including in several of the focus countries of our program. As team, we extend our solidarity to our partners, colleagues and students in these places and call upon our political leaders in the global north to take a firm stance against these atrocities and to take their responsibility in stopping these violations of human rights immediately. This sorrow made us realize that in a world of increasingly polarized debates, what is needed more than ever is that we continue to talk with one and another, even if and especially when we disagree. We need to reach out and nurture partnerships with those who, like us, aim for justice and peace, even if we follow different paths. And above all, we need to continue to think of others as they are us and we are them. So therefore, I would like to start this symposium with sharing a poem by Mahmoud Darvis, a late poet from Palestine, who reminds us to think of others in everything we do. As you prepare your breakfast, think of others. Do not forget the pigeon's food. As you conduct your wars, think of others. Do not forget those who seek, seek peace. As you return home to your home, think of others. Do not forget the people of the camps. As you sleep and count the stars, think of others, those who have nowhere to sleep. As you liberate yourself in metaphor, think of others, those who have lost the right to speak. As you think of others far away, think of yourself. Say, if I, only I were a candle in the dark. And with these words echoing in our souls, I would like to hand over the virtual microphone to our master of ceremony and the one who largely, largely organized this symposium, my dear colleague, Ein Contractor. Thank you, Yelche. And I welcome you all to our very first annual symposium from the Water and Development Partnership Program. Over the next three days, we will listen to 15 presentations with varied perspectives, some based here in the Netherlands at IHE Delft, and some from our partners, our international partners all over the world. Each day of the symposium is divided into two sessions with three presentations each, followed by reflections, where we hope to share stories, not only of success, but also of failures, of uncertainties, and of what we don't yet know. We hope that you have all received the, the symposium program. And for those who have missed it, my colleague Deborah will also share a link in the chat to view the program. Before we begin, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat freely and interact with each other throughout the presentations. 
Uh, but if you have a question for the speakers, please put it in the question and answer section, uh, which you will find in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. At the end of all three presentations, there will be space for reflections. At this time, you can raise your hand and the host can give you permission to speak. We also encourage you to use your camera while speaking, but please keep in mind that this session is being recorded for online distribution. Um, with these housekeeping rules in mind, I would like to introduce our first session, Advocacy for Impact, um, and our moderator, uh, welcome our moderator, Paige Shipman. Paige works as an independent consultant, supporting diverse campaigns and advocacy initiatives on human rights, economic, environmental, and gen gender justice issues. Prior to becoming a consultant, she worked for Friends of the Earth International, where she played a key role in developing global programs and campaigns, including an international solidarity system to support at-risk environmental defenders and a global campaign to make finance and investment more just and environmentally sustainable. Uh, we're really honored to have Paige Shipman join us and moderate this session. She's a very experienced um, facilitator, and we're very happy to have her with us. And along with her, we have uh, Murta Shannon for Rapporteur for this session. Murta Shannon has a special relationship with our program. Uh, he's a senior water governance expert at the Dutch Environmental and Human Rights Organization, Both Ends. He works with civil society groups around the world on water justice issues, and he has a PhD in international development studies. Um, and I say that he has a special relationship to our program because in the lead up to the UN Water Conference earlier this year, Murta worked with us to organize the collaborative drafting of the Transformative Water Pact with over 40 grassroots environmental justice organizations from the Global South. Uh, so um, I'll pass the mic to you, Paige. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I want to thank you all for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, play the role of kicking off the symposium with all of you. And I'm sure today will bring about some really informative and hopefully very inspiring discussions uh, about a variety of topic topics and first and foremost, advocacy for impact. Um, I wanted to launch the discussion today with just some thoughts from my perspective as an environmental justice advocate. Um, I can see, I think we have, uh, let's see, some 200 uh, people on uh, or at the symposium today, which is really exciting. I think we all bring to the symposium a very diverse set of knowledge and experiences. You all are working in very different ecosystems um, with very different contexts, with very different communities. Uh, but I believe that we're all here together because we share one thing, and that is a commitment to transformation. Um, Yeltsa said it very well, to inclusive, equitable, environmentally sustainable water management practices. Um, it's a lot of words with a lot of syllables. Uh, so one of the questions I think we need to ask ourselves is what does that mean in practice and how do we go about it? Um, I think today we have a lot of people uh, participating that are, come from a very scientific background, uh, maybe academic backgrounds. You all are water experts. One thing, unfortunately, that we know, and, and we can say this with our experience from climate change, is that scientific knowledge alone is not going to bring about the change that we know we need. So the point, I think, of this discussion today is to talk about going a step further than research, a step further than knowledge building or evidence building, um, even a step further than analysis, because what we really need to do is actively convince people, uh, particularly decision makers and policymakers, to take that knowledge uh, and do things differently. So to change laws, policies, and practices. Um, this is how I see advocacy. Um, and I think it's also really important to talk about how advocacy itself, how the advocacy process itself can and should contribute to the inclusivity and the transformation uh, that we seek. And I think this is very nicely captured in a simple phrase that probably all of you know, I hope you know, nothing about us without us. Um, I just 
feel that it's important to underscore the need to learn from the very people that we aim to support in our practices, in our in bringing about a transformation. Um, I think it's important to recognize that their experiences and insights, uh, those particular people who have the least amount of access and control over water, whose power is circumscribed, to make sure that they are playing a key role in our advocacy processes so that our advocacy can be inclusive by recognizing that it's important to learn from them, to support them, and to ensure that we're amplifying their voices, amplifying their demands, and ensuring that their access and decision-making power over water uh, is secured. Um, I think that well, I, I said the word, and I think it's really important, the word power. <laughs> um, I, I see our task, uh, per perhaps the most challenging and crucial aspect of our task is addressing the power imbalances uh, that lead to uh, exclusion, that lead to lack of access to water. Um, and I see that as uh, not just power on, on a global level, although that's very important, but power on the local level as well and everything in between. So this can in include addressing power relations in terms of exclusion and oppression based on gender, based on ethnicity, based on caste, religion, um, and very much so the power imbalances between the global north and the global south, um, what many would now refer to as part of a very important decolonization process. Um, so my point is, is that not only do we need to think about advocacy, how we do it most effectively, but also about the way we do advocacy um, as a means of achieving our goals. Uh, so it's important to ask ourselves questions like who's involved in our advocacy activities and how, whose knowledge and expertise is recognized, what stories are told, who tells them, how are they told, um, what are our goals, and who decides what those goals are. So those are just some questions that I want to pose to you today. Um, and I encourage you to think about those questions as we move through the symposium and as we move through the session uh, over the next hour and a half. Um, and I'm delighted that in this session, we're going to hear from three ab about three very different advocacy initiatives. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters for joining us to share their experiences. Um, and as I think was mentioned just a few minutes ago, we'd like to hear not only about your successes, but also about your challenges, uh, your lessons learned. Um, I'd love to hear what didn't work or what you wish you would have done differently or what you're doing differently now based on experiences and um, the learning process. Um, we have about 10 minutes for each uh, each presenter, each guest, and we will have time following all the presentations to answer some questions. So please uh, put your questions in the question uh, box at the bottom, and we'll see at some point either uh, immediately following the presentations if we have a bit of time or at the end of all of the presentations uh, to have the Q&A session. So with that, I would like to turn the virtual microphone over to our first speakers. It's uh, Florence Tanui and Bessie Katambi, and excuse me for my horrible accent. <laughs> uh, Bessie has a background in international conflict management and a PhD in environmental governance and management from Wangari Matai Institute of Peace and Environmental Studies. Florence is a postdoc fellow at the Department of Earth and Climate Sciences at the University of Nairobi. She does research on groundwater in arid and semi-arid regions in Kenya. And both Bessie and Florence have indicated that their aim, I love this, this is really beautiful, is to translate re research into actionable solutions and thereby improving environmental governance and management, particularly uh, in relation to groundwater. So I would like to welcome them to give their presentation. Thank you very much, Paige. And uh, we're very grateful that we were considered to be here to share our experience on groundwater. As my colleague Florence is putting up our slides, uh, we, are, we are also working with one of our, uh, with IEG and uh, 
GWS sense. All right, so I will pick from uh, where. All right. Um, thank you, Florence. We are looking at the impact of water security and where we had our project was in Trukana. What does water security mean for us? Um, it is having water that is a secure place that has a good quality and it is accessible to everybody. And it also means that we look at the future of the next generation, will they have the same resource? And this is what we looked at uh, when we were looking at our project in um, Trukana. To give you a background of Trukana, Trukana is one of the Northwest uh, counties in Kenya. We have 47 counties in Kenya. And Trukana is also considered an ASA, which is a uh, arid and semi-arid uh, county with what is so unique is that it has a huge lake that is still salty, but this is not the lake that provides water for the people of Trukana. The people of Trukana as well have been considered under the marginalized communities within uh, the nation of Kenya. And from this, we, we looked at how do we improve their water security? How do we work together to advocate that water indeed is life? And how do we get them to have this water? So in this, we had our project, which is called REACH. And with the REACH, our focus was on four things. It was four prone. The first one, we were looking at climate change resilience, being that it is a county that experiences both drought and um, uh, floods at the same time, different times of the year, we sought to uh, make them to be climate resilient. We also looked at the issue of water quality and this issue of water quality looked at how the water they have, is it safe for drinking? Is it safe for them to have? Do they have access to fresh water? And if they do, how do they, how do they access and is it affordable for them? The other aspect here now, we looked at the inequalities. There have been a lot of conflict within this region because of that resource called water. So the inequalities, both culturally, at the community level, at the county level, this we addressed by involving them from the onset by, uh, and getting to hear what the inequalities they have experienced over a long period of time. And they don't work in vacuum, so which brings the fourth aspect, which is the institutions. These institutions are not just the government institutions, are also the community institutions, so that we can influence policy and make sure advocacy is well done and within their limits uh, to access this water. And that is what we are calling the impact. And I'll call on Florence to give us the key aspects of what we, we were able to experience in this place. Lawrence, be sure to unmute your um your microphone. Yep. Yes, sorry for that. So um just uh thanking Bessie for the comprehensive uh introduction that she has given. The Rich program began the research in 2015, and I'm going to report on the key advocacy impacts that we achieved since uh 2015 to date. So uh, the first one is reducing inequalities. Uh, Bessie has given a background that uh, Turkana is actually very marginalized in terms of water accessibility and also development uh, perspective. And um, one of the first messages is that there is need to reduce uh, inequalities. And what we did was to ensure that we make impact from the research perspective is that you have to bring everybody on board that is consulting before the research begins to ensure that uh, we capture their perspective and also the knowledge in which they knew about safeguarding their water resources and also where their water resources, especially the fresh water areas were uh, situated. So we had to consult them to understand their needs in terms of policy gaps and also in terms of uh, the water access issues. We involve them uh, throughout the work, during the field works and also going back to them to be able to share the research outputs and be sure that they were 
involved in all the steps of the work. So the four words that were very important to us was consulting, involving everybody ranging from the communities, the government stakeholders that were involving the NGOs in the regions who are also carrying out different water projects and collaborating to, uh, with them for um, eventually making uh, informed decisions from their scientific outputs. And so the second uh, message that we had was that uh, we had to identify where the vulnerable communities were. And the most important thing was that the freshwater resources in this area was quite limited because it occurred along the riparian areas of the major uh, river, that is the River Tuckwell, which is the only perennial river in the county. And so we found out that most of the poor households or poorer households were actually situated uh, at the far flung areas of this uh, river where groundwater was also very uh, saline. And so what, uh, what we came uh, to understand was that inequalities with water access also varied with areas where there was fresh water and also areas where we had um, saline uh, water. And so for this, we had to take this uh, such outputs or such information to the discussions with the county um, county uh, stakeholders to be able to make them understand their water needs and also how the communities are having or experiencing different water related uh, challenges. Uh, for, the, for this purpose, uh, Turkana County is being able to be informed with where to expand the water supply initiatives that they were undertaking. And that message was uh, the fact that there is need to action on already um, immediate water needs. So the first one was that while we have identified the communities that had high level of vulnerabilities to do with uh, groundwater and also where inequalities were quite uh, significant, we highlighted regions where the groundwater was quite saline and also these communities were isolated and lived far away from uh, the freshwater resources. And one of the initiatives or interventions that the county and especially the Lodwa municipality undertook was uh, establishing a water tracking program, which involved uh, delivering fresh water to the, to the communities uh, around two to three times a week to be able to caution them from continuously drinking uh, the saline water resources. So this is um, a result and also being sharing the same information uh, with the county with respect to the fact that drinking saline water, of course, is harmful to health and also making these communities to be aware and to be able to demand for the same uh, to be done for them even after the project has exited. And the second uh, part of impact is building capacity for climate resilience, which focused on uh, institutional strengthening and also, of course, uh, environmental uh, management. And uh, as we know that uh, arid areas, we have lack, lacking data. So what we did was we had multiple methods in which we had to be, to go to the ground and establish where data could be found. I am aware my time is half, but uh, this diagram shows all the sectors that needed to collaborate to be able to protect the Lodo alluvial aquifer system, which is the only freshwater resource in the area. If we had extra time, I could go around uh, to explain what it means, but the outer circle uh, indicates what which institution could play a role in terms of either affecting the water system positively or negatively, but collective action needed to be taken along these thematic areas to protect the water resource. This, uh, I will focus on this middle uh, image, which showed areas of high salinity and areas of uh, fresh water, that is the dark blue. So this map is being used at the county level to actually uh, drill wells for fresh water for the communities at the moment. So it is a decision-making tool. And also we developed an environmental monitoring plan, which uh, the, we, we recently launched uh, two weeks ago uh, with the, at the national level for the purpose of having the same being done for other counties 
specifically the that target the aquifers that are vulnerable to human contamination and also issues to do with climate change. Uh, we have trained uh, water sector professionals in this area to be able to implement the documents that I've just shown and issued them uh, with certificates for the purpose of uh, showing that they took part in the training and they are able to take uh, the actions that have been proposed in the Environmental Monitoring and Management Plan, which is, I think, one of the very key uh, decision-making documents that will go long-term in terms of uh, protecting uh, the water resources and also informing the county water plans. And finally, this is the approach that we have used, uh, data gaps, stakeholder engagement, risk-based approaches for scientific outputs, and of course, uh, capacity building tools for the county that can go a long way into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Florence. I really appreciate it. And sorry that to have you speak so quickly um, to make sure we have time for the, the rest of our uh, discussion. But thank you. It sounds like an incredibly comprehensive and very powerful project. And I think we will probably have some questions uh, following the other pre presenters. Um, I would like to introduce Annika McGuinness and Leonard Nakuza. Um, they both come to us from InfoNile in Uganda. Uh, they are part of the driving force behind an online platform that focuses on building trust and connection and collaboration between water scientists and journalists in the Nile Basin. And since the platform's launch, which is just a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, more than 600 users have already registered for accounts. Um, and the, the goal of the, the platform is to increase collaboration between journalists and scientists. And so we will hear more from Annika and Leonard about this, uh, this exciting initiative. Welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having us and InfoNile on this call. Uh, so I am here to present about our project called Nile Well, the gate for transboundary water research and communication in the Nile Basin. And I am presenting alongside my colleague, Leonard Namukasa, who is our programs and strategy manager. I'm the co-founder and managing director of InfoNile, a project of Water Journalists Africa. So InfoNile is a cross-border group of more than 780 water and environmental journalists who we call geojournalists with a mission to uncover critical stories on water issues in the Nile River Basin through data-based multimedia storytelling. And we focus on building the capacity of journalists and connecting them to water and environmental scientists to report original cross-border investigations. Um, the issues that we are addressing as InfoNile and in this particular project are one, the increasing water and environmental crisis in the Nile Basin, but at the same time, insufficient resources and training for journalists to produce stories which are based on data and science and which can lead to action in the water sector, and also a disconnect between journalists and scientists, partially due to a trust gap between the two groups, which we have found through working with journalists and scientists for many years, and also uh, a lack of skills on the part of journalists to report on science and also on scientists to be able to communicate their research. So these are some of the issues that we are attempting to address in our project funded by DUPC3 with the objective to foster transformations to the sustainable transboundary sharing of water resources in the Nile Basin through catalyzing science-based information with impact. And essentially in this project, we are attempting to bridge the gap between water scientists and journalists to contribute to advocacy on water issues in the Nile Basin through good journalism. And the outcomes of our project include establishing a learning network of scientists and journalists. So here we are building upon our existing networks. Uh, you can see the actors in the project. We have the Nile Basin Capacity Building Network Foundation as one of our partners. Uh, which is a network of scientists and water researchers in the Nile Basin. And we are maintaining a network of journalists. So we are attempting to increase and improve upon this network. Uh, we are training journalists in science communication, and we're also training scientists in science communication, how they can better communicate their research. Uh, we are attempting to reach engaged decision makers with information through various kinds of events, programs, and stories. 
and also work with young people and communities uh, to increase water sustainability still through storytelling. Uh, we are also documenting all of our best practices in science communication through this project with our partner IHE Delft. And our main output that we wanted to showcase on the forum today is our Niowell platform. This is a platform that we launched in April 2022, which connects water and environmental scientists and journalists. So this is what the platform looks like. When you get to the homepage, you are able to connect, to search and connect with either a scientist or a journalist. You're able to join some of our training programs or browse different resources that we have on the platform. Uh, currently, since April 2022, we have been able to recruit 183 researchers and 444 journalists, all from the region, uh, onto this platform, and they have established 259 connections. Uh, we have also posted 91 resources. So this is what the platform looks like on the inside, and when you search for a journalist or a scientist, you can search by location, by research interest, or by their name. When you get to their profile, you can connect with the person and you can also send them a message which will go directly to their email. When they respond via email, you are in direct communication with them. So the platform facilitates that initial communication, that initial uh, step maybe for the journalist to reach out to the scientist for an interview, and then the communication can happen, can happen over email. Uh, we have been doing activations since the start of our project to promote this platform through our network of coordinators. We have nine country coordinators and also our team, which is based in Uganda. Uh, in these activations, we have visited different research and scientific institutions, as well as different media houses uh, to recruit journalists and scientists to the platform and explain more about it, uh, and also organizing science cafe events that bring together the two groups. Uh, so I won't go into details, but these are some of the institutions that we have visited so far, and we're planning to have the next activations in Rwanda, Tanzania, and Burundi. Some of the learnings that we had during these activations, one, there are many concerns among the scientists about the security of the site, the protection of their data, and the resolution of conflict. So in response, we worked with our scientists and journalists, we consulted with them, we consulted best practices for other platforms, and we worked on terms and conditions with our lawyer, which we uploaded to the site. We have also been addressing various technical issues, which we have been trying to improve over time. And our focus so far had been mainly on recruiting members. So we then embarked on the second stage, which was focusing on engagement. Part of this is including a points accrual system where users will be able to gain points for participating in events, for connecting with other users, and at the end of the quarter or of the year, they'll be able to receive prizes based on the points that they accrue. The other way we are trying to engage users now on the site is through a program called Science Wednesdays, which we launched in March 2023. This is a monthly program where we invite a scientist every month to share his or her research with journalists to inspire reporting and forge connections between the two groups. It is just a one hour cafe, including a 20 minute presentation on the research from the scientists, questions from the moderator and from the journalists, and then a review quiz where uh, we also award prizes at the end to the participating journalists. These sessions are live streamed on the site and the presentations uploaded to the resources section. And we always share the scientist's profile with the journalists that could enable them to connect and to collaborate after the, the session. Uh, we would also like to invite other scientists from IHE Delft who may have conducted relevant research to join us in future events. We would love to have you. So these are some of the topics that we've covered so far from many different countries in the Nile Basin and different topics around water and environment. Uh, and these are some of the impact we have seen. We have seen a couple of stories reported by journalists after the events based on the research that we shared and about 64.5% said the program was meeting their expectations and 22.6% said it was exceeding, which was quite positive feedback for us. Uh, about 77% said they had made connections. So you can see some of the other impacts here, um, the numbers who said they had been able to connect after the event and, or send a message to the platform. So uh, now I'll turn it over to my colleague to talk about the other program that we have launched under this platform. Oh, thank you very much, Anika. As a way of infernal to practically do the 
uh, the fellowship between scientists and journalists. This year in July, we started a co-production program, which brought in journalists and scientists from the Nail Basin. These journalists, we selected eight journalists and eight scientists from countries under the Nile Basin, brought together to trade to be trained on the biodiversity reporting, transboundary resources, and others. So the program is running, it's up and running, and these two are working together in order. This would help to bring down issues of mistrust, issues of miscommunication, and maybe to try as much as possible to see how the two can work together. And it's uh, we have a very good communication uh, between the journalists and the scientists. Uh, the training was residential. It was held in Entebbe, and several sessions uh, several sessions were done. Uh, uh, in, uh, we are done and apparently the program uh, is run online. We are supporting the journalists and the, and the scientists in several several uh, several activities. For example, they have different communication outputs like they're supposed to come up with at the end of the project uh, or, the print or the end of the program, one podcast videos, stories and others. And all of this will be published by them and the radios or maybe media houses that the journalists are working in. Uh, we have encountered challenges while implementing these projects. For example, these challenges, they are not so cross-cutting by the range between different countries. For example, Burundi, South Sudan and Sudan. We hardly got scientists because of course, you know, what is happening in, in countries like South Sudan and Sudan. Then the issue of Rundi is something to do with the language, which is really quite challenging. The fact that they use more of French than English. However, it is an, uh, a lesson learned. And as Info9, we're trying as much as possible to see how to, to work upon this. Then we have, uh, we're encountering another challenge of permission to access from researchers. Some of this research is owned by different institutes. so. It takes a while for us to get the authorization to access that research and maybe be used by journalists. Still, we still or we have issues of mistrust and misrepresentation, uh, where researchers believe or scientists believe that journalists are really not uh, not representing them very very well. But somehow through the co-production program, we are really seeing that work is coming on out well, and at least there is some big big relationship and we are planning to have another co-production program which is going to take place next year and we hope by the end of the two co-production programs surely we shall have the issue of mistrust reduced thank you very much for listening to us Leonard and Annika, thank you so much. We have a couple questions and we have a little bit of time to ask you uh, some follow-up questions. Uh, one came, one you sort of br very briefly addressed. Um, the question was, are there any political conflicts among these countries? And if so, does that conflict influence the work of the journalists and scientists in the Nile Basin? And you mentioned that, but maybe you want to say a few more words on that. Um, and we'll also have a, a Q and A session after the final presentation, but we just uh, take a, a couple minutes to follow up on that question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Yes, we encounter those conflicts. For example, if you look at the conflict that is happening in Sudan, it is something that has really disrupted our work. It is making it a little bit uh, complicated. And the journalists, majority of the journalists actually in Sudan have moved maybe to different countries, Ethiopia, uh, UAE, and others. This has really impacted most of our projects because to try to get to reach them is quite challenging. However, we try as much as possible to make sure uh, maybe when the peace or when the, the, the issue of the conflict reduces, somehow we try to reach out to them. However, it is really so much impacting our programs. However, we're trying to see how we can work with them even when they are far away from their home countries. Yeah, just, just to follow up on that, uh, water resources in the Nile Basin can be quite a political issue and has caused various tensions. I don't know if I want to call it conflicts uh, per se, but definitely there are tensions over water resources between different countries in the Nile Basin. And this does affect 
um, the ability and willingness of both the journalists and the scientists to be able to put out the information in a very neutral manner when there are political influences. For example, we have we have had challenges um, bringing on board scientists from different countries to talk about the issue of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, even scientists who have done very good research on this topic because of maybe fear um, and those kinds of political political reasons. So it's definitely a challenge that we face, but this is why we try to focus on co-production and collaborations among both the journalists from different countries and the journalists with the scientists uh, to be able to bring out more unbiased information which comes from different sources. Uh, this improves the safety of the journalists and the scientists and also improves the credibility uh, and the depth of the work that they produce together. So yeah, thank you for the question. Great, and there's one actually that follows up quite a bit on what you just said that uh, was was just maybe very briefly touch on. Um, how do you effectively persuade scientists or journalists to participate in the program? Uh, uh, thank you very much. I don't think we persuade them because the word persuas persuasion would sound like we are trying to, uh, but we put up a call. For example, in this co-production program, we put out a call as Infonai, invited prospective scientists to come and take part in the program. Of course, there is a stipend to that, which Infonai gives to each of the scientists. And that uh, maybe some of them are also looking for various platforms where they can publish their works, their good works, apart from other than the boardrooms and wherever. So it is also an opportunity for them that they feel it, uh, they could exhaustively uh, use. And secondly, uh, they feel uh, most of their good works go un unreported. So they feel it, working with journalists, trying to understand each other would help to bring out maybe some of the information they're putting out, some of the issues they're trying to put out, especially in line with water, biodiversity and others. So uh, we, uh, and, and, and genu genuinely speaking, we have had maybe different uh, applications from several scientists and actually maybe we even don't have a choice. We can't even afford to, to work with all of them, but rather select a few of them. That's great that there's so much interest. Thank you so much for the that uh, for your presentation and the interesting information. And we have some more questions, but we'll get to those after we hear from our final speaker. And um, I'm going to invite or first introduce Emmanuel Akpabio. Um, Emmanuel is the coordinator of the WASH Gender Project, Nigeria. He is a professor of human geography and the current director of international programs at the University of Uyo in Nigeria. He's also an international associate at the UNESCO Center for Water Pol Law, Policy and Science at the University of Dundee in the UK. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, uh, Pratt. Uh, a project chair, uh, we are trying to understand, for instance, in Nigeria, because we've been a lot of literature on gender-based discrimination in access to water, uh, where women... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Emmanuel. Uh, yeah. Have, have you seen the... Is it shared, please? No, we're we're seeing the just the list of files, but not the presentation. Oh, my God. Let me see. I've shared here. It's, uh, it has come up here. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Let me in and we share. Has it come up? No. Not yet, the manual. This is. Yeah, Would you like us to share your presentation? Uh, please, you can share it. Please, thank you. Okay. So Nadine is sharing it. So okay. please tell her when you want to change the slide. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. So, uh, 
Yeah, a project uh, is on trying to understand how being a man or a woman uh, influenced the cap your capacity to access water, uh, sanitation and hygiene in part of Nigeria. Of course, you can see the context here about the quality, the type, category of water people drink in some communities. Uh, for instance, uh, in the riverine areas, this one, uh, this is the kind of water someone uh, community drinks. In the upland region, these are the sources of water for drinking and other purposes. And depending on location, the categories of toilet people use also differ depending on context. Uh, for instance, in riverine areas, in one of the communities we visited, I hope you are seeing the pointer there. This is the kind of toilet, uh, but this is segregated for men and women. Uh, uh, because this kind of toilet, uh, if it's once it is flooded, it can take and cover some sources of water. In fact, affect some sources of water, including the salt that will be coming from the main sea. So this is the main context here. But a question is about how being a man or a woman uh, influences uh, access to uh, shape access to these sources of water. We all know there are some socio-cultural issues surrounding uh, 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 surrounding uh, some communities in regard to accessing water for different categories of the gender. So a study tried to look at this uh, uh, in southern part of Nigeria. And so uh, this is what, uh, I think, can you change this slide, please? Uh -huh. So now, uh, we what we actually observe here is uh, we see severe discriminations. Uh, for instance, very importantly, uh, mothers of twin children, lactating mothers, menstruating women, uh, find it difficult to access some bodies of water, depending because of some sociocultural beliefs surrounding those bodies of water. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in, in Eastern Obolo, uh, that one, uh, uh, mothers of twin may not have problem, but lactating mothers will have problem, will not uh, be able to, they're not given access to, because of some beliefs that once they are spiritually, they are unclean. And if they have access to that body of water, it will start spewing some impurities and can dry off, uh, affecting uh, the entire community until some rituals are made. So there uh, is some sacrifices. So we did these findings and others, uh, but our uh, interest is on these categories of findings, mothers of twins, because it went viral when we organized media chat and also in a phoning program in a local radio station. Nadine, can you please... Uh, uh, share the screen. Okay, so uh, actually we went about uh, trying to get the media into this uh, perspective because uh, uh, it is written in the literature. People may be hearing a lot about this, but uh, studies, systematic studies trying to capture the challenge, the level of challenge in some local communities is very, very lacking. So we took up the challenge and did this. And when we reported this, uh, uh, briefed the media on this, I think uh, it was a big surprise because it went viral. And what actually happens is uh, a touch on the government of the day first, uh, they insinuated politics uh, that the opposition is trying to uh, push uh, us into discrediting the government. And this kind of uh, thing led to counter narratives, uh, trying to say that uh, we are working for a different set of body, that the story is not quite true. And uh, it was followed by pressure on the affected communities to deny report, uh, which they resisted. And also followed up by independent media investigations, which they actually confirmed that. And then, what happened here is, Nadine, please, can you share it? Can you share it, please? Mm -hmm. 
what happened here is uh what we did was first thing we went on uh, uh trying to we went on trying to get the communities in a very large public meetings to have their conversations con have conversations on this and related issues initially we were very afraid because uh, these issues are very sensitive but we gather some cooperation in one of the communities, especially in the upland region, uh, and so uh, in a public meeting, women were supervised and they couldn't say much, but we broke up the meeting into uh, smaller groups. Uh, well, we could gather some snippet of information, but when we got one-on-one -on -one interview, we discovered the women were very open in what they said. Uh, but this was quite different from the other communities, Eastern Obolo, uh, for which women were highly supervised. In fact, 98% of participants were men. And we tried our best to get women involved. It wasn't possible. But at a certain point, they granted limited access. And we allowed our ladies in the team to interview them. We got very frank perspective about that. Uh, but uh, during this, uh, we used the media quite a lot. And then we decided to engage, get this message across to high profile in the, uh, associations and individuals. Uh, one of the associations we tried to meet was the University of Uyo Women, made up of different uh, scientists and professionals, uh, which was led by the wife of the vice chancellor. And then uh, we shared our message and they decided to collaborate with us and uh, uh, and then which led to us hitting the street. In fact, they were that you see the message, the images there. Uh, that is when we start started moving around the street to preach against this thing and maybe share our findings to the general public. Uh, so at the end, uh, there was an important outcome here. Please share, please share the slide, Nadine. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, the government that was quite in denial of uh, this kind of issues and challenges uh, came up uh, to set up uh, a focused Ministry of Water Resources and Sanitation. I think that was uh, August uh, ending or so. And then there is also a high profile NGO operating around uh, the state. Uh, decided to visit the community to actually found, find out if what we discussed were true, which the communities themselves actually collaborated in spite of the effort to suppress uh, uh, their own uh, perspective. They stood by what we did. And so that kind of message led to government actually gradually responding by first setting up this. Uh, please, uh, Nadine, share, share the slide. I know my time is almost off. Uh, then uh, what actually happens here is uh, uh, the lessons we have here is in this kind of study, we have uh, multiple layers of power relationship uh, for which we try, how do we try to navigate that? Then we have to, we find a way of working one-on-one -on -one to get a uh, true perspective from individual victims. And so we build trust. We build trust with communities. If it were not possible, the communities would have been forced to deny the report. And uh, our old findings would have been uh, kind of uh, demonized to the extent that they will only end up circulating in the literature, international literature or, or one way or the other. So we also had a challenge of the media uh, reporting, focusing on the main headlines, uh, mothers of train, lactating mothers. They ignore all other element of uh, toilet uh, uh, challenge, sanitation challenge generally. Uh, well, we actually understand this, which has to do with the nature of the media uh, operation here, which is mostly on commercial, uh, trying to get headlines that will attract some money, uh, some commercial values, than uh, something that focuses on real development. Uh, so we had this kind of challenge and uh, uh, but one way to overcome that was to actually build trust and share findings directly with the people. And in one of those instances, we engaged in a local phone-in radio program, uh, thanks you, and we took the message in a local language and it attracted a lot of thousands of phone-in, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, millions of participants actually viewed the, I mean, listened to the 
radio station. But many calls came up, raising a whole lot of issues, raising many issues around this, and also setting example that encouraging us to get to many other communities, which we say, well, because maybe future kind of a thing. So uh, what is not in place, uh, the last, uh, what is actually happening here is just a lesson, a lesson of uh, in trying to get messages, I think we focus on getting the local language very, very important because we may report things in the broader uh, literature uh, using English language and the people don't actually understand and don't follow what we do. And also building trust in local communities actually help us understand what actually goes on and actually can force the government to act. And in this uh, case, that has been the case, forcing the government to act on this matter. Thank you very much indeed for uh, that. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. I, I'm not sure if it was just me, but you dropped out for just a few seconds, but uh, but I think hopefully everyone uh, heard most of your, uh, your presentation. It was excellent. Um, I have one question that immediately comes up for you, and I was wondering if you could just say a bit more about your tactics for um, ensuring that women were involved in the project. You mentioned it briefly, but maybe you could say just a few more words about that. Yeah, actually, what we did was uh, is it it was difficult to get women into large public meeting in communities, highly supervised in one community at length for the two percent participated in order about two percent. So what we did was we built trust and actually allowed in the first community allowed uh, the community to actually grant us uh, to work in a group, group of women, group of men, and group of youth and mix. And so, but still, we were able to gather quite enough, but it was not quite okay. We actually get to engage on one on one. Some victims identified women who have who are victims of these challenges, and also others who can also support us with information. That was where we had very detailed kind of conversations, including uh, uh, so women, and then for the other community we were able to, they granted us to give access, get access to few women leaders. And that is during the interview, that is how we were able to gather useful information because it was very sensitive. If you ask, they were like very sensitive. It's a no-go area. There are red flags. and uh, uh, But when we got to the few women, they tried to clarify a number of issues, which probably would not have been possible in a larger group. So women leaders and, and women uh, only uh, spaces. And secondly, a team, team composition uh, was, uh, in fact, women, ladies actually participated uh, almost uh, uh, higher higher than uh, in a few work. Uh, we have, we had female participants, uh, uh, above 50. Uh, we, the men were very limited because we knew this kind of thing affect women very well because we've been having follow up and follow up uh, uh, conversations on this. Mm. I'll put another question to you, and then I also have um, quite a few questions for Bessie and Florence, who um, we will come back to, to you and to Annika and Leonard. But uh, one more question for you um, that came up is whether or not you or how you or if you intend to um, cascade these outcomes. So I think upscale this work to other communities in Nigeria. Uh, this is very, very, very highly possible because even when we had a phony conversation in a local radio, uh, we had many, many issues uh, brought up by uh, local communities in other areas who said this, they pointed their own unique challenge about women being discriminated is very different. So if you enter one community, you see a different story, you get to another community, you see a different story, and also all choice to be there, which we said no. Our scope only covered what we, because of limited uh, funding, that that may be a research of the future, which we hope uh, probably to scale up. If we can partner with uh, local uh, foundations or communities, and also get uh, uh, some people to do studies, because we've already, we have some um, uh, fellows in our uh, project, which we award, and they're also investigating on the, working on this topic. So if we can get more, because many, many postgraduate students, potential postgraduate students have had interest in working in this field. So we hope we can use them to make in route 
And also, we also hope after this project, we may also get some opportunities to actually go more into some gaps that we've identified to fill in. Thank you. And it, it strikes me it's quite interesting to have um have heard from about the, the InfoNile project and then your project and see the key role of media in both of those projects and the role yeah. of journalists potentially to, to be part of the advocacy process. So of course, yeah. media outreach being very vital to your strategy in a way. So that, that was quite interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, all right. um, we have a couple or at least uh, one question for Bessie and Florence. So if I could ask you to come back to the stage. <laughs> um, the, there was a question about whether or not the service delivery plan caters uh, for maintenance, and if so, who funds the maintenance, which is, is certainly an interesting question. Yes, so allow me to answer that particular question. Um, what happened is that the REACH program, uh, if in, it was in the interest of time that we compressed all the information, uh, actually has a maintenance uh, project, which is called Fundifix, that works to maintain or to ensure that the breakdown of the community water supply, uh, water points are actually repaired in less than 72 hours. So in this case that uh, they have a funding model in which the government contribute a little of the fund and also the community water users. And of course, it gets some fund from also the Water Services Trust Fund. And uh, it has actually uh, worked with the communities to ensure that there is constant enrollment to expand the, the service to areas that are not covered. And then it, that is in Kitui County and the same is being initiated in Turkana County. And in the Turkana County, the water service delivery model, they are focused on ensuring that since there is an existing uh, sewer uh, utility for supplying urban water supplies, it focused on ensuring that there is optimized uh, demand supply vis-a-vis -vis the existing uh, infrastructure in which uh, the, the company is responsible for, of course, uh, maintaining th that particular uh, water supplies. And uh, we have seen the interest of communities wanting to adopt what it is in Kitui County where they subscribe to the Fundifix model in which they pay a little uh, amount, but then the company uh, delivers on the, uh, on the maintenance in case of a breakdown. If there's no, of course, breakdown, they continue to pay for the future uh, restoration of the scene, yeah. Thank you. There was another question also, um, and I think it's a kind of a broad level, um, but so maybe you can give us some, share some of your wisdom, um, both of you, uh, about how you most effectively trans translate research uh, findings into policy and action. And again, you touched on it a bit, but maybe you have some wisdom you would like to share with everybody. Yes, um, I think the REACH program as uh, actually been a model in terms of a science project that led to uh, policy impacts. And it just began by of our, us understanding the needs of our study area. And the first thing we did was, I mentioned the engagement, but it went beyond engagement. We had a field office where we had uh, members of our staff available to follow up on the county needs and follow up on the water initiatives around the, the counties. And also one of the important thing was that we reviewed all the county development plans to ensure that we understood their context of water going into the future. So when we carried out our research, we also intended, apart from the scientific, scientific uh, publications, we intended to have some input into their own development uh, programs. Uh, like for example, the need to expand the water supplies to cover the communities that were not accessing the water. We had to play a role there by showing them where the fresh water resources are, because this is an area where we have largely uh, saline groundwater areas. And so this guided investment so that you don't drill a well that is quite expensive and then you get saline water or it is contaminated in a way with high fluoride levels. And another thing that we, we did uh, on that round was to 
produce documents in small um, briefs to ensure that certain scientific products, like for example, aquifer delineation, led to the to stopping of the allocation of uh, land to areas where there was uh, it is uh, covered by the aquifer. So this is a town which had uh, development uh, before planning. That means it is sitting on its fresh water resources. The water table is quite shallow. The geology there is so uh, sandy and it allows for contaminants to flow into the aquifer during the recharge periods. And so there, those dynamics also spread all the way to the land governance issues, urban planning issues. And so it showed for us the need to develop an environmental monitoring plan, which we co-developed with the county to ensure that everybody and all the stakeholders were involved in this to ensure that it is cross-cutting and it will be accepted by the, uh, it will not be affected by the political changes because it is not defined by a certain period, but then it is short-term, long-term, mid-term and long-term, and it is uh, working well for us. And just to mention, we co-developed the county climate change policy uh, because the county approached the REACH program to be able to help them have some inputs regarding the protection of their water resources because they saw that was going to be an important part of the climate impact uh, in, in, in that note. And I think just to add, because there was a question on uh, whether I could expound on the climate part, uh, let me uh, just handle that as well, is the issue of climate change is quite uh, significant because we have water insecurity driven in two uh, dimensions. The first one is that the water scarcity driven by the drought because it is in an arid environment. But then in the wet season, uh, in, the, in 2020, 2021, uh, where we had COVID, also, there was a very uh, huge flood event that happened in the area, which disrupted or, or uh, it washed away around nine municipal boreholes. So there was a scarcity of water, not because there were no infrastructure, but the infrastructure has been washed away. So such dynamics required uh, informed attention. Yeah. Well, I mean, such a it sounds like such an amazing program, and I have to uh, say, your uh, your what you, the point you just brought up is in terms of the way in which it connects with land governance issues is a very important point, and I think probably many of us on this call are uh, very aware of the interconnectedness of many of the po policy debates that you all are uh, involved and engaged in. So congratulations for that work and thank you. I just um, want to uh, move on to just some few final questions for Annika and Leonard. Unfortunately, we have quite a few questions still and I think we will not have a chance to get to all of them. So I thank you all for your participation. Um, we, won we have a couple of questions First of all, is it possible for um, for regions outside of East Africa to participate in uh, in the platform? Yeah, thank you so much for the question and for the interest. Um, for now, we are really focusing on the Nile Basin, but we encourage anyone who is interested to be part, especially of the webinar series, the Science Wednesday program to join. I will put a link to join our listserv in the chat, and then you can be informed of with our regular communications of when these happen. A lot of the topics are not only relevant to the Nile Basin countries, but could be relevant to other regions. Uh, and occasionally, we also bring in researchers or water professionals from other regions to share best practices that could also be relevant to the Nile Basin. Uh, we also have some programs, however, that are Africa-wide. This is something we are venturing into, especially as Underwater Journalist Africa, uh, beyond the Info Nile project in, in particular. Uh, for example, our most recent youth science communication competition was actually available for anyone, any science or journalism student in Africa to participate. Um, and we had a lot of participation from West Africa and Southern Africa, as well as the Nile Basin countries. Uh, we are actually having the award ceremony for this competition on Friday, so we encourage anyone interested to join as well. And yeah, through Water Journalist Africa, uh, we're also embarking on establishing our network and our programs in other regions. And journalists especially could always share stories to be published on the Water Journalist Africa website. 
Mm -hmm. Someone asked a very concrete question, but I think it's an interesting one about um, language and how you deal with the difference in languages uh, across the Nile Basin. If that poses challenges and what what uh, strategies you have to deal with that. Yeah, it, it is a big challenge and an opportunity. Uh, it's a multilingual region. So one of our main strategies uh, of being able to work with journalists and scientists who speak different languages is working through our country coordinators. We have coordinators and our team in all of the 10 countries. Um, 10, not 11, we have not yet reached Eritrea. But these coordinators help us to translate all of our stories, either from Arabic, Amharic, Swahili, and French, to English or the other way around. And sometimes we also support journalists to, to work in collaborations where maybe a national level journalist will be working with a community-based reporter reporting in a local language beyond even the main uh, international languages of the Nile Basin. So these collaborations also help us to be able to publish in local languages that we don't speak as staff and coordinators. Uh, for some of our programs, like some of our main webinars, we may provide live translation in some of the major Nile Basin languages. However, for some of the programs like the co-production program, this was available only to English speakers. And we recognize that this is a big limitation. And it's something we have been talking about a lot as a team. And we, we hope that we can consider providing more live translation, even for the in-person programs. Even though it is resource intensive, we feel that it's very important. So thank mm -hmm. you for the question. And yeah, it's very relevant. And a couple people asked, I mean, you had addressed the issue of how do you involve scientists, but is there um, a similar strategy for involving journalists or is that similarly not a, a problem? They're that, uh, <laughs> that interested in being involved. Oh, yeah, thank you very much about that question. Yes, uh, we have several, uh, other than scientists, we have also journalists who are taking part. And there are several motivations that uh, make these uh, journalists apply for these several grants. One of them is the passion. Because in order for journalists to, to report fully about a specific thematic area, they are led by a passion. Some of these journalists are really passion, passionate about water, biodiversity, and environment issues. So that is one thing. Then secondly, at InfoNight, we have our biggest strength, which is training and mentorship. Yes, this is something uh, we train in several areas that are journalism, to mention but a few, even water and others. So they know that not only will they get the grant and maybe uh, not only will they support the project, but also they will get the knowledge and skills in several other areas. And we have tried as much as possible to support these journalists to make sure that they can enhance their skills and knowledge in other factors. Of course, maybe we understand that they need some little bit of, of support resources. Of course, it's not so big. We don't really have a very big budget to do that, but at least we support them here and there. But majorly it is the the passion uh, from the journalists and the training and mentorship that we offer at Infernal and Water Journalism Africa. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions actually back to Florence and Bessie. So people are bringing up their questions. Uh, uh, so if you could return to the, the screen. Um, one very specific question was, did you use ensemble techniques in groundwater modeling to provide up-to-date information about uh, current groundwater conditions? And how does the community respond to the proposed equitable groundwater solutions that you've developed so far? Yeah, first to apologize uh, for Bessie. She has a technical issue and I, uh, she's also teaching in a class in a moment. So I'm going to respond. I am um, the groundwater researcher who undertook the work. It was part of my PhD work to uh, investigate the groundwater resources in, in Lodwa. And so I used various tools, techniques in a slide that I showed. I showed uh, how we did uh, geological mapping and geophysics. Then we also carried out uh, seasonal water quality uh, monitoring 
for the purpose of understanding the uh, change. And one of the findings we've got here because of uh, the dissolution and the fly aquifer. Then on the isotope techniques, we were understanding the sources of recharge into the, the aquifer. And that's where we linked much of the recharge to be attributed to the perennial river uh, in which, of course, the aquifer was just occurring within the basin. And so uh, we did also um, analyze the age of, of the water and we linked uh, high saline water to, to non-tritium bearing uh, groundwater. And so that means that the groundwater in the area which we consider to be fresh is the one which is highly vulnerable to the climate change and also pollution because of its um, of the age of the water. And then we developed the, um, uh, we didn't develop the numerical models because of the lacking uh, borehole logs and, and of course the water table fluctuation measurements in the area. And uh, what we did was to develop a conceptual aquifer model for the purpose of understanding the three subsystems that we have the shallow, intermediate and the deep zones in which the shallow system might uh, related to the surface water of, of the, of, in the river. And then what we have done or what we are doing as part of my postdoc activities is that we do not want to leave this area with the same uh, baseline that there is no monitoring uh, network. So we had to implement some of the uh, research outputs. And one of those is that we are drilling uh, six uh, piezometers to be able to at least start the monitoring as part of the a demonstration of how also the EMMP, that is the Environmental Monitoring Plan, which has a monitoring component, could, could be implemented. And so I was happy that the project uh, could go that far to install uh, the monitoring networks to monitor uh, some water quality parameters and also, of course, the uh, water levels. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Florence. I'm going to wrap up here because we only have just a few more minutes. Um, and I want to say there are um, a lot of outstanding or several outstanding questions. But, uh, but of course, this is a symposium for several days and IIT Delft can put you in touch with each other and with the presenters to follow up on some of the very specific questions that are maybe not necessarily applicable to the whole group. Um, so this is not the only opportunity to get your questions answered, but thank you all for posing these questions. I want to um, call on Myrta, who has been our rapporteur during the last hour and a half and has probably been typing away vigorously. Um, Myrta, would you be willing to wrap up the session by just uh, bringing to fore some of the conclusions or interesting observations you've heard? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Peter. And thanks, thanks everyone um, for your very interesting presentations. It's a great honor to be able to wrap up this session, which leaves me with the, with the challenge of how on earth to summarize such a, such a stimulating and, and, and rich um, set of presentations in a few minutes. Um, I just want to start with a quick anecdote. I used to be a researcher myself. I used to be an academic. Um, and then I made the move to civil society because I wanted to become more engaged in what I was researching a few years ago. So I now work in the realm of advocacy. And making that switch, I completely underestimated just how much expertise and knowledge um, is required to do advocacy uh, uh, properly. I'm still learning. So I know... I, I have experienced this sort of issue from, from both sides of the spectrum that we've been discussing here. And I just want to quickly briefly, ref and because of that, I want to also underscore just how important uh, um, places like this are where, where researchers can get together and discuss these types of issues. Because, um, you know, traditionally speaking, academics and researchers aren't really uh, traditionally trained in, in the sort of the dark arts of advocacy. So there's a lot of a lot of learning to be done there, a lot of challenges and a lot um, a lot of experiences to be shared. So I'm really great that this that this uh, that this uh, event uh, took place and that you're all brave enough and also uh, uh, to, to share your experiences. So we saw three very interesting presentations. Obviously, it started with the um, GWS Sense presentation from uh, Florence and Bessie in Tacana. Um, and I really, uh, I really, it was a very detailed um, uh, water modeling uh, research that was also linked to institutional engagement and community engagement. And I really appreciate the centrality that you gave to the issue of 
in, of, um, of inequality and tackling inequality and also establishing partnerships with um with the county and it's, it's great to hear that you were that you were able to actually uh, uh that your research was 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 able to reach the reach to policy um uh, policy changes at the at the county level that's that's quite quite something and then the next presentation after that was obviously the info nile um uh, pro project from from leonard and annika very interesting stuff I, I i really like this type of um transdisciplinary which is what it is essentially collaborations between um, academics and, and and journalists in this sense, which are not typically used to work together, but uh, actually kind of rely on each other, uh, I'd say, to, 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 to reach the types of impacts that they really tend to be working towards. That also comes with all sorts of challenges, and I really appreciate that you were reflected on those challenges, um, including the sort of, you know, the distrust that exists between between um, between journalists and also between um, um, scientists. Uh, this is something we I'm sure you could have talked for for a lot longer about how you how you how you dealt with these these types of challenges. And then after that, we had the Watch Gender um, project from Emmanuel in Nigeria. Very interesting. Also, I mean, it, you know, I, 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 I really appreciate that you were able to uh, really share these types of challenges and experiences that you had when when trying to bring your 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 findings out into the media and then and then bring it to the journalists and then suddenly you get caught up in this sort of this you know this this these, these dominoes falling over of, of of journalists taking it going viral politicians taking it getting defensive a counter narrative being uh, developed all of these types of dynamics that you don't really have control over but it is kind of the 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 the, the scary and the messy political reality of of advocacy. So I really appreciate it um, that, and I'm also glad to hear that you were ultimately able to 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 bring people together more through those processes of of, of public consultation and, and engagements. So I mean, you know, just to just to wrap it all up, I just want to say this really emphasizes the importance of this type of this type of issue and the type of collaborations, more collaborations between scientists, journalists. Also, policymakers, but also, just to speak from from my own perspective, civil society and grassroots groups, um, and 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 advocates. I, I really think there is a lot more to be gained by working together on these issues. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep it at that. Thanks very much for your for your presentations, and and I really look forward to more of the more of the uh, sessions in this in this kind of um, touching on this theme. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marta. That was um, a very impressive summary. Um, I'm really, um, yeah, I'm really impressed by how how much uh, you're able to absorb from uh, very fast presentations. So thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you also to Paige for moderating this, our very first session of the symposium. Um, and thanks for, to all the presenters who made it here through all the uh, tech tests and um, for sharing your very rich experiences from the field, which are so important for us to learn from in the water sector. Um, we are going to go uh, into a 10 minute break now. Uh, and the next session will be technology for impact. We will start at uh, 15.35 CET. Um, but the session will remain live, so you don't need to leave the call and come back if you don't want to. Uh, and stay tuned. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody.